My guest today is Devin Turnbull. His company is OJAS. Well, he is an entrepreneur. He, he is based here in Brooklyn. He builds things here in Brooklyn. But he started out as a DJ. He has been a men's fashion designer. But he is, he is one of us. He has built pro sound custom installations here in the US, in Japan, in Hong Kong. And I, I keep hearing, I keep hearing his name. I say, I, I, I got to talk to this guy. So finally, it all came together. I went over to his, his beautiful home and I hung with him for a few hours and I listened to his sound and it was really, really impressive. Really impressive. It, it, there's something really going on here. So anyway, he's into horns, as you can plainly see. And just looking around his listening room, and well, everywhere I looked, it was one cool thing after another. It's a collection of cartridges, for example. Anyway, so much cool stuff and so much to talk about. Devin sees himself as an outlier, and I think he is. But I think he is also maybe the template for what future high-end audio entrepreneurs will look like. You know, the old guard is, is going to fade away a bit, and then it'll be people who are taking audio in new directions. And some of those directions will look like what Devin is doing. But anyway, let's get deep into the conversation. I'm very aware of the fact that I'm, that I'm an outlier. Because I start, uh, uh, you know, had a formal education in audio engineering, um, more recording, but, you know, I, I, was, I was pretty well versed in, um, you know, the, the, the science and, and language of sound. And in school, I had just taken basic electrical engineering courses on, uh, you know, troubleshooting, mostly it's like troubleshooting gear, fixing broken gear. Uh, you know, they're kind of training you in audio school to For like studio work. be a roadie or yeah. work in a studio. Yeah. But, you know, I knew my way around a circuit, uh, you know, a schematic, a circuit diagram, a schematic. Um, and if you know, even really, if you know nothing about um, reading electronics schematics, you look at the, the schematic for uh, most single entrowed amps, I mean, there's just not much going on in there. <laughs> right, right, right. It's just a few, it's just a handful of resistors, capacitors, and coils. I mean, it's, 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 not, it's not much. You really have to know the very most basic uh, symbols to read these circuit diagrams. And that was it kind of, for, it was kind of it for me. I, I sort of was like, I'm pretty sure I can, I can build one of these. And then it was kind of, uh, you know, I think I can graft together a few different circuits and, and uh, start to kind of develop my own taste level when it comes to, to some of these circuits. And by no means am I, uh, <laughs> you know, circuit designer, engineer. I mean, I, I'm always relying on the help of people that are smarter than me. Um, you know, I, I know I'm never going to be the, the smartest guy in the room. I'm just somebody who like trusts their gut and mm. their, and their ear and kind of like follows their heart when it comes to building their own system. Devin, I think you've, uh, <laughs> I think you've, your heart's taking you in the right place. I mean, I started building my own gear. Uh, my, my initial intention was just to build myself a system um, that I had my hand in from really like start to, to finish, but not just for the sake of reimagining things that existed, but because the things that I wanted were not accessible to me. Okay. So yeah, transcription turntable motors were uh, one of the first places that I sort of started getting to inspired to, um, you know, build my own version of something which was really kind of of a tried and true decades old proven invaluable component in these mm -hmm. kinds of audio systems and what about the electronics you're into tubes in a big way uh i am into tubes in a in a big way i mean uh i mean i think if we start surveying these japanese audio magazines um most of the single and trout amps are bespoke they're going to be unique in some way mm. um so you know i uh I, I started kind of looking at uh, that 
world of you know i don't even want to call it like a market right it's like it's just like a, almost like its own it's a culture it's a culture mm-hmm. it's a culture yeah i don't know exactly where i am or where i'm going but you know i'm just trying to be true to myself trying to be true to my interests and uh and hopefully people find that interesting as well well i think so but obviously guys you can tell I guess you might have noticed that Devin likes horn speakers. Subtle clues here in the picture. And, uh, but before that you were, uh, I guess the most logical thing before you were doing this is you were a DJ, right? I mean, DJing is, I guess, where my love of records began. Mm -hmm. Um, I think I was probably about 12 years old when I was first exposed to like DJ culture. Um, You know, the early 90s and uh you know DJing was really like the predominant form of music playing I think at the time um you know uh, this is in the era when Techniques 1200 started outselling Fender Stratocasters at Guitar Center yikes um uh I remember that was like sort of a big thing but yeah I mean from for my generation DJing was like a, a huge part of the um you know music culture and youth culture at the time um, and yeah, that's where I started collecting records and listening to, to vinyl. Um, and yeah, I guess in a lot of ways my path did start there. Yeah. And here you are in Brooklyn. We're neighbors practically. Mm-hmm. Got this beautiful house and, uh, this room, I'm going to show pictures of the room. There's so much cool stuff here. I could, you could leave and I'll just stay here for hours just poking around. It would be fun. You're uh, welcome anytime. I, I may th- I'll take you up on it. I am intrigued. Absolutely. So the speaker that's on your right, right <laughs> that is a kit speaker, right? Yeah, this is the, uh, well, we sell it as a fully built speaker. Oh, you do? Okay. Or as like a flat pack kit. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, you know, the story behind this speaker is, I think like everything in my audio practice was just a 100% organic growth. Uh-huh. Um, you know, I didn't start this, you know, I, I have a hard time even referring to it as a brand, mm-hmm. but I started this, what I think of as my, my audio practice out of just an interest in this form of listening to music, of listening to recorded music in a way that's ritualistic, if you will. Ritualistic, I like that. That I want my hi-fi to be a bit like a shrine, you know? I wanna um, enter a space where I don't have to think about, uh, where I can get get lost in music and uh, experience music in a way that's more intentional than, you know, background music, essentially. Sorry, that was a bit of a a tangent, but you are asking about this speaker. Um, I, this speaker was also not the, the kit form of the speaker was not um, devised as a product, really, the same way I think my brand wasn't really, uh, I didn't set out to create a brand. Um, this thing came to be in the early COVID-19 um, quarantine period. So I'm sitting on my stoop and thinking, like, what, what could we do? Maybe something in kit form. And um, I, I thought, you know, DIY audio there's really not much uh, in, in, in within my peer group. When I tell people that I'm building speakers, it's completely foreign to them for the most part. And I'm um, sitting on my, my stoop and I'm thinking, I wonder if I could find like five people interested in building their own speakers. And we could do, this is also a, a moment where, you know, group Zooms were like really taking off as a way of hanging out. And I thought, that'd be really cool if I could get, you know, five or ten, um, you know, friends of mine, cool people, interesting people to get into a Zoom and like build speakers together. I feel like that would make uh, a statement culturally that people would take note of. So I'd, I'm in this kind of train of thought. I'm sitting on my stoop and I wrote just a sort of stream of consciousness post on Instagram about... Um, what if I could, yeah. what if I could uh, develop this kit speaker? I could 
have it available in the next few weeks. Um, you know, who'd be interested in participating in this? And it was absolutely the closest thing to viral that I've ever done. I mean, at the time, I think it had, I mean, it had like a hundred times more response than a lot of my other Instagram posts. I had at least 350 people in that post commenting saying, you know, I would love to do this. You got to do it. Let's do it. And I mean, I was completely overwhelmed and blown away by that response. And so we were kind of off to the races. Um, but could you scale up? So we, I have, uh, I, that, that was just an idea. <laughs> we, I had no idea how I'd do this. And in the shop, we have one uh, invaluable partner, essentially, uh, who's kind of a, a master cabinet maker who... Uh, runs a CNC table and oversees all of the, the cabinet making in our shop and um, And where is that in the Brooklyn Navy Yard? Okay. It's a walking distance from here oh. Eric is his name uh, and I had this conversation and we both just got really inspired and uh, To his credit he came up with the idea of using this Cabaneo uh, joinery system made by Lamello uh, uh, Lamello is a, a Swiss manufacturer of super high quality biscuit joiners. That's what they're really known for. They're like the, I don't know, the Rolls Royce of biscuit joiners. So their newer kind of more tech innovations are essentially a CNC-able pocket screw. So it's like a plastic plug that you can CNC three holes at the bottom joint of a piece of plywood and you CNC a, essentially a pilot hole on the piece you're joining to. You pop this little plastic thing in and there's a, a screw in there that uses a special screwdriver attachment. Okay. And that will give us the ability to build this cabinet without needing clamps. The idea is we'll include everything. We'll include the glue, we'll include the screws. Like literally you need nothing other than maybe a screwdriver handle. And if you've got it, a, you know, an electric screwdriver, screw gun. Um, and so we really quickly developed this thing. I had already designed the speaker because I just wanted uh, I, I had been, um, you know, developing this speaker sonically for um, a year or so, and I was sort of just starting to talk about it, and I was very excited about it. It's perfect scale for this kind of DIY project. I think it's a perfect size speaker for someone's first system, wait, especially... Wait, wait, when you originally designed the speaker, it wasn't for DIY, right? You Correct. just made it as a speaker you were going to sell. Yeah, it right? just seems like a, it's a useful scale mm -hmm. um, because most of the speakers that I build are so prohibitively large right. that there are a lot of applications where like the speaker just doesn't fit. Mm -hmm. But I love the efficiency. Um, I love the presence of big horn-loaded speakers. I love um, what probably most... American audiophiles would consider a speaker that's too big for the room. Mm -hmm. That's like my comfort zone. <laughs> I love a big speaker that just loads a whole room with sound. That for me, the presence that that brings, that's really like the, the essential element of this for me. Mm -hmm. And a lot of these guys, you know, I have an Instagram account that I run um, called Listening Room, which is just translated, digitized um, articles of the listening rooms from Japanese audio magazines. Wow. And a lot of people comment on the, some of these rooms like, oh, this guy's an idiot. The speaker is way too big for that room. It must sound horrible in there. If you kind of follow the story of particularly MJ Radio and, Radio and Experiment magazine, which is a, a really important audio technology journal that's a monthly published magazine in Japan. I can grab one right here. Just happen to have one. Uh, I happen to have several hundred right here. Okay. Um, this magazine has been running um, since I, I, I know shortly after World War II, if not even like pre-war. I, I don't know when it started. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. They talk a lot about their a fundamental part of the sound of these rooms is like a big speaker in a small room. Okay. And, um, you know, you've experienced uh, this room, and I think that this room is, in a lot of ways, my homage to... It's not, it's not a tiny room. It's not tiny. How big? It's... Uh, 18 by 18 feet, this room is. Oh, okay. So it's square. 
It's a square. It doesn't sound like a square. New York City, it is what it is. Uh, one of the most sonically striking things about hearing a system like this for most people who have mostly listened to you know high end, more conventional high end systems, is this presence that comes from like a big sound motor in the room that uh, you know I've never heard a small speaker that can make a room so alive with totally rich sound. By conventional American audio, high-end audio standards, people would say, this isn't going to work. Mm. And it sounds beautiful. 